Chapter 20 They went from the terrace gardens down into the bowels of the locks and dams of Kapal. From the grey light of an afternoon rapidly fading into dusk, they descended stairwells and passageways that curved deep into stone and timber. Shadows gathered about small pools of hazy light given off by the flames of oil lamps dangling from iron brackets. The air trapped within the massive rock of the dam was stale and damp. Through the silence that pervaded the lower levels came the distant rush of waters flowing through the locks and the low grinding of great wheels and levers. Closed doors came and went as the four passed deeper, and there was a sense of a beast hidden somewhere within, stirring in response to the sounds of the locks and their machinery, caved and waiting to break free. They came upon few dwarfs within these levels of the fortress, the forest people who had survived the great wars by tunnelling within the earth. The dwarves had long since emerged from their underground prison into the sunlight and in so doing had vowed never again to return. The aberrance of dark, closed places was well known among the people of the other races and it was only with some difficulty that they managed to endure such closures. The locks and dams at Kapow were necessary to their existence vital in the regulation of the waters of the Silver River, as they flow westward to their homeland, and so the sacrifice was made, but never for long and never more frequently than was required. Brief shifts to monitor the machinery that they had built to serve their purposes were followed by hasty exit back into the world of light and air above. So it was with that few faces the four companions did come as they made their way downward, bore a look of stoic endurance that barely masked an abiding distaste for this most unpleasant of duties. El Fore gave evidence to trace of it, though he bore his discomfort well. His fierce dark face was turned forward into the maze of corridors and stairwell, and a solid frame was erect and purposeful as he took his companions through lamplight and shadowed towards the storage room yet further down. As they went, he told Year and Edane Lesserdale the story of the Melrats. They were a species of troll, he explained in beginning his tale. The trolls had survived the great wars above the earth, exposed to the terrible effects of the energies those wars had unleashed. Mutated from men and women they had once been. They had altered in form, their skin, body, organs adapting to the frightening conditions the great wars had created over almost the whole of the Earth's surface. Northland trolls had survived within the mountains, grown huge and strong. Their skin toughened until they had taken on the appearance of rough tree bark. But the Maoris were the descendants of men who had sought to survive within forests that the great wars had turned to swamp. The waters poisoned the foliage disease. Assuming the characteristics of creatures for whom swamp survival was most natural, the Maorats had taken on the look of reptile. When Slanter called them lizards, he was describing them in truth as they now appear. Scaled over where skin had once been, arms and legs grown short and clawed, and bodies grown as flexible as snakes. But there was a greater difference yet between the Melrats and the other species of trolls that occupied the dark corners of the four lands. The Melrats climbed back up the ladder of civilization, had been more rapid, and had been marked by a strange and frightening ability to shape change. Survival had made fearful demands upon the Melrats as upon all of the trolls. In the process of learning the secrets of that survival, they had undergone a physical transformation that enabled them to alter their body shape with the pliability of oiled clay. Not so advanced in their art as to be able to disguise their basic characteristics, they nevertheless could shorten or elongate, elongate all of the parts of their bodies and could mould themselves in ways that would allow them to adapt to the demands of any environment 
in which they found themselves in. Little was known as how the shape changing was done. It was enough to know that it could be done, to know that the Maorets were the only creatures who had mastered it. Few beyond the borders of the Eastland knew of the Maorets, for they were a reclusive and solitary people who seldom ventured beyond the shelter of the deep enough. No Melrets had come forth in the time of the councils at Paranor. No Melrets had fought in the wars of the races, withdrawn into their dark homeland within forests, swamps, and mountain, mountain wilderness. They had kept themselves apart, except where the known people were concerned. That was, some time after the first council at Paranor, a time more than a thousand years earlier. The Melrets had migrated up from Swampland and broken forests into the wooded heights of the Ravenswamp, leaving the dank and fetid mire of the lowlands to the creatures with whom they had shared those reasons, those regions since the destruction of the old world. The Melrets had drifted into the higher forestlands, inhabited a scattered tribe of gnomes, a superstitious people. The gnomes had been terrified of these creatures who could change shape and who seemed to command elements of the dark magic that they had brought to light with the advent of the druids. In time, the Melrets began to take advantage of that fear and to assert the authority over the tribe living within the Ravenswood. Melrets assumed the role of chieftains, and the gnomes were reduced to slaves. At first there was a resistance to these creatures, these lizards as they were called, but after a time all resistance ceased. The gnomes were not strong enough or organised enough to fight back, and a few terrifying examples of what would be done to those who failed to submit made a lasting impression on the others. Under the rule of the Melrats, the fortress at Greymark was constructed, a massive citadel from which the lizards governed the tribes, inhabiting the immediate region. Years passed and the whole of the Ravenshorn fell under the sway of the Melrose. Dwarfs to the south and gnome tribes to the north and west stayed out of those mountains. The Melrose in turn showed no inclination to venture beyond their newly adopted home. With the coming of the Warlock Lord and the Second War of Races, it was rumoured that a bargain had been struck in which the lizards offered a number of their gnome subjects to serve the Dark Lord. But there was never anyone who could prove it for a fact. Then with the conclusion of the aborted Third War of the Races, the war in which Sheer Olmsford had gone in search of the mystic sword of Shannara and the Warlock Lord had been destroyed, the Melrets had unexpectedly begun to die out. Age and sickness began to deplete their numbers, and only a handful of young were born into the world. As their numbers declined, so did their sway over the known tribes in the Ravenswood. Bit by bit, their small empire crumbled away, until at last it was limited to Greymark, and a few tribes that still remain within the region of the world. Now it seems that these last few too have been driven back into the swamps that bred them, for Raker concluded his tale. Whatever their power, it was no match for that of the walkers. Like the gnomes they ruled, they would become slaves as well, were they to remain within the mountains. Better that they had been wiped from the face of the earth, Slanter interjected bitterly. They deserve no less. Do they in truth possess the power of the dark magic? He asked. Rekka I've never seen it. The magic is in the shape changing, I think. Oh, there are stories of the ways in which they affect the elements. Wind, air, earth, fire and water. Maybe there is some truth to that, simply because they have developed an understanding of how the elements react to certain things. But for the most part, it's just superstition. Slanton muttered something unintelligible and gave Yeer a dark look that suggested he wasn't in complete agreement with the dwarf. You will be safe enough, Bombsford, for I could smile gravely. 
the dark brows lifted. If they were foolish enough to use the magic within these walls, you would be dead quicker than you could blink. Ahead the darkened corridor grew suddenly light, and the four approached an intersecting passageway and a line of doors stretching down to their right. A pair of sentries stood watch before the closest door. Hard eyes turned to over tea their approach. Boraker spoke a quick word and greeting in order that the door be opened. The sentries glanced at each other and shrugged. Take a light, the first said, passing four acre and all in. The lizard keeps it black as pitch in there all the time. Four acre lighted the lamp from the wick of one hanging beside the door and glanced over at his companions. Ready? he told the sentries. Latch bolts released and a crossbar lifted. With a mournful groan, the iron-bound door swung open into total blackness. Four acres started forward, word wordlessly. The other three a step behind. As the faint circle of the lamp penetrated the gloom, the humped and shattered form of crates, packing cases and sex stores came into view. The dwarf and his companions stopped. Behind them, the door swung closed with a bang. He had glanced about the darkened room apprehensively. A rank and fetid odour permeated the air, a smell that whispered of things dying and foul. Shadows lay over everything, deep and silent about their little lives. Stiffs! Boraker spoke the name quietly. For a moment, there was no answer. Then came the shadows to their left. From out of the corner of crates and stores, a stirring broke the silence. Who is it? Something else. Poor Acre, the dwarf answered. I've come to talk. Bradham sent word that you and I would come. <sighs> the voice rapped like a chain being dragged over stone. Specs you would, dwarf. Something moved within the shadows, something huge and cloaked like death itself. A shape appeared, vague and shadowy, rising up beside the stores. The air felt a sudden overwhelming repulsion for what was there. Get very still, voice within him warned, saying nothing. Little peoples. The figure murmured coldly. Dwarves and horse knows mustn't be right in little peoples. Step closer. Step closer yourself, Warraker snapped impatiently. <sighs> to light the light, the darkness. Warwicker shrugged. Then we'll both stay where we are. Hey, the other agreed. He glanced quickly at Slanter. The gnome's rough face was twisted in a mask of hatred and disgust, and he was sweating. He looked as if he might bolt at any moment. Yet Daniel Essendale must have seen the look too, for all at once he moved around Yeah and Foraker and placed himself almost protectively on the other side of the distraught gnome. I'm fine. Slanter muttered almost inaudibly, brushing with his hand at the darkness before him. Then abruptly the Malarat came forward to the edge of the light, a tall cloak form that seemed to materialise from out of the shadows. Essentially man-shaped, it walked upright on two powerful hind legs, crooked and muscled. Four arms reached out tentatively and were there should have been skin, and here there was only a covering of toughened grey scales. Ending in crooked claws. Within its cowl, the Malarat's face turned toward them. Reptilian snout lifting into the light, scaled and split wide to reveal rows of sharpened teeth and a serpent's tongue. Nostrils flared at the snout's blunt end. Further up, almost lost within the cow's darkness, slitted green eyes glimmered. Stats, stats, nose what? Brings you, little peoples, the monster hissed slowly, 
knows well. He was silent. Greymark, Bullraker said finally. Rats, the other whispered. Snow walkers that destroy come out of the pits from the black hole of the mammal, from climbs to heaven's well to poison the waters of the silver river, poison the land, destroy it, comes into Greymark, does the evil, comes to drive us from our homes, enslave us. You saw it happen. Ulrika saws it all. Raids come from darkness. Drive us forth and seize what is ours. No match for such power. Flee! Some of us destroy. Slanter spit suddenly into the darkness, muttering as he shifted back a step and kicked at the stone floor. Stay! The Melrit has suddenly. An unmistakable tone of command in his voice. Slanter's head snapped up. Gnomes, have no fear to us. Friends, have we been? Not like the wraith. Wraiths destroy all that is life. Because they are not life. Things of death. The dark magic rules. All the land will fall to the But you have a way to destroy them? Or a press? <sighs> Greymark belongs to us. Wraiths trespass in our home. Think themselves safe with us gone, but wrong. Ways to get at them then. Ways they do not Passages, he exclaimed suddenly, so intent on what the other was telling him that for an instant he forgot his vow. At once the Maurit's head snapped up as if an animal testing the air. The air went calm, a sense of something tremendously evil settling over him as he stood there in the sudden silence. The Maurit's serpent tongue snaked out. Magics! Little friend, magics do you have? No one spoke. He was sweating violently. Boraker glanced about at him sharply, momentarily uncertain as what to what had happened. In your voice, little friend, the Melrep whispered. Sense it in your voice, I do. Sense it in you, magics like my own. Do it for me, yes, speak. Something seems to wrap itself about you, some invisible coil that squeezed the breath from him. Before he could help himself, he began to sing, quick and sharp. The wish song slipped from beneath his clenched teeth, and waves of colour and shape rode the air between them, dancing through the darkness and lamplight giving lamp-like living thing. An instant later year was free again, the coils that had bound him gone, the wish song died silent. The Velman gasped and shocked and dropped weakly to his knees. Slanter was at his side at once, pulling him back towards the door, yelling wildly at the Melrat, grappling with his free hand for a day in Elisadale's long night. Hurriedly, Foraker parted them, his own sword drawn free, as he turned to space Sith, the Melrad and suddenly shrunk in size, withdrawing into the shadows of the cowed road, stepping back again into darkness. What did you do to him? Foraka snapped. The Melrad shrank back further, slitted eyes gleaming in the black. Foraka wheeled abruptly. That's enough, we're leaving. Stay! The Melrad wailed suddenly. Speak with Sith, can tell you of the rates. Not interested anymore, Raker replied, banging his sword handle against the storage room door. I must talk with Sith if you wish the rates destroy. Only I know how. Secrets mine. 
The creature's voice was hard and impossible to call now. Oh, please, Tim, your friendliness gone. Little friends will come back. Must come back. Be sorry if you leave. We're sorry we came, it then, Elizabeth threw back. We don't need your help. Yeah, he was walking through the open doorway now, supported on one side by the elven prince and on the other side by Slanter, who was muttering every step of the way, shaking his head to clear it. The veilman glanced back at the Maori, a cloaked and faceless shape squeezed deep within the shadow as Waraka took a small light from the room. Needs my help? The creature said softly, scaled arm lifting. Comes again, little friends. Comes back. Then the dwarf sentry were closing and barring the storage room door once more. Latch bolts and crossbars snapping tightly into place. Yeah, took a deep breath and straightened himself. Shrugging free of the supporting arm, Boreka stopped him, peering closely into his eyes, grunted and turned back down the passageway they had brought them. Yeah. Guess you're all right, he yeah, announced. Let's get back up into the air. What happened here? Yeah. Edan Elisadel wanted to know. How did he make you do that? Yeah, he shook his head. I'm not sure. Still shaking, he began walking out the Boreka. The elven prince and the gnome on either side. Just not sure. Black devils, Slanter muttered heatedly, invoking his favourite epithet. They can twist you. The veilman nodded briefly and walked on. He wished he knew how that twisting had been done. 